What are you doing here? I thought I might do a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm doing your accent as well. I think I'm doing your accent. You start emulating me. I don't talk like that, Paul. <laughs> ach, ach, lad. Ach, lad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Give me a Kiwi accent. Go on. Kiwi accent. Yeah. It's just no tone. Yeah, go on. I don't think I can do it. I've got uh, too much of a I kinda, proud brogue. I can't do it. <laughs> My brogue doesn't allow me to talk like you. Can I? Can he do it? <laughs> Can he do it? <laughs> yeah. This is going right, I think. Yeah, yeah, this is yeah. Great. This so, is, this is so yeah. Balls, I mean, off the walls. <laughs> off the walls. Off the walls podcast. Yeah, off the walls podcast. Yeah. So. Talk to some uh, muralists. Yeah. Learn some stuff. Muralists, learn some stuff. I hope to learn a lot, but... um. I think it's just great to have a bit of a conversation with other people that do what we do. and Yeah. Yeah. It's my favorite kind. So it's nice to know you're not alone. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You're just in your studio all day by yourself. It's like, actually, there's lots of people in their studio all day by themselves. <laughs> yeah. All thinking the same thoughts. Well, maybe. <laughs> no. Yeah. But no, it's, it's cool. We have some, we'll talk about some process. We'll talk about some mm. cool stuff that people do. Mm -hmm. Talk about some ideas. Yeah, a bit of mental health maybe. I'm kind of interested in that, how we all oh, yeah. deal with balancing the, the existential crisis versus the balancing the books to balancing the stuff they want to make to the stuff maybe they feel oh. they should just make because they know they'll sell that or someone will like it easier. Or, yeah, yeah. You know. Nice. I think that, uh, yeah. <clears throat> nice to hear what other people think about that. And just how they make it work. Mm. I think, you know, I, I, when I introduce myself now, it's an, I quite happily introduce myself as an artist. Mm. I know that most people hear that, they think of someone in their studio with a craft doing it all day. Mm. But um, I think that definition of an artist is someone that kind of engages with the public or um, like works with a kind of broad idea of what a medium is and how you communicate with people and how you tell stories or whatever it is you do. So I don't feel like I, I don't have... To, I have to undefine myself as an artist just because I'm also, you know, a producer or a project manager or a curator or a... Yeah, yeah. You know. That's right. It just kind of feels like it's all part of it. Yeah, definitely. Especially uh, in 2021. It's yeah. Like, yeah. The romanticized idea of the artist making the art and that's it. It doesn't exist. Yeah. As far as I know. <clears throat> the mean mustache. Mm. Oh, you, you can still have a mean mustache. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Stripey shirt and a glass of wine. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Gesture. It's done. Yeah, all that stuff. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, who did you get for today? So, today we have Ross Liu, aka Trust Me. He is a great first guest because he's kind of, he's part of our origin story. Mm. So way back 2015, when I had the ridiculous idea of starting a street art festival in Hamilton. Got in touch with Ross and he's a total champ. He said, come and have a coffee. So I went up to Auckland. Yeah, I mean. And uh, yeah, went to Verona and, and just he just said, this is how you do it. And well, this, he said, this is how he did it. And um, that Generous. was better than what I knew at the time, which was pretty much nothing. Yeah. And um, that was awesome. So that got us started. And then he also painted in the first Graffiato, so yeah. two, two, not Graffiato, first Boone. Yeah. Um, 2015. Yeah, we do Boone, Paul. Boone's, Boone. Boone is the name of the thing that we do. Where am I? What? Yeah. What, what city is this? Remember? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so we are here with Ross Liu, and Ross is an artist from Auckland. He's a street artist from way back, initiator of the Graffiato Street Art Festival, and part of our origin story, actually, for Boone. So it's awesome to have Ross with us here right now. Welcome, Ross. Thanks, guys. Well, thanks for being our, um, our, our first, our guinea pig. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself other than my very brief introduction? Oh, that's about it, though, isn't it? <laughs> no. Uh. Are, we, are we done? <laughs> it's quite a short podcast. Yeah, wrap it up. <laughs> um, mm, yeah, uh, yeah I, started, I started making um, paintings on paper and started putting them like gluing them to walls on the street um when i was i'd finished up at uni and um it just made sense so that was the first sort of like proper play with it and i'd always thought about um 
public space as public space, but from a, a art perspective, is being aware of like I studied art and design, and there's artists who had been doing intervention or working with public space, it's completely separate to the idea of graffiti, street art, or whatever. Um, that was where I probably came familiar with the idea, and then uh, you know at uni got a bit more familiar with the other stuff that was happening, you know, in my neighborhood or in my city. But um, it wasn't until, yeah, I'd finished uni and started making paintings on paper. Because the, the, the appeal was simply like, well, if you're going to make an artwork and you want people to see it, then why would you put it in a room, in a building, where people have to go purpose, purposefully to see? And that has opening hours in, you know, a week or two weeks. Why not just put it, like, on the wall in the public space where I'd already seen, you know, people's art practice take place. So that, that was that. And then, and then very laborious making painting on paper and putting it so, you know, pretty quickly turned to um, screen printing. And then I just started screen printing lots of different artworks and you know, doing like a hundred at a time, and then going and gluing them up outside, and then just doing more, doing more, doing more. Kept that going, and then through that, met um, met uh, Sparrow and Gary, who um, started Cut Collective with. Um, I already knew Haley, um, so that's uh, oh, artist names component in Force One. Met them just in the neighbourhood because they they'd been doing. Things you see it, and they go, It's uh, in a different format <clears throat> to graffiti. And you're like, uh, Curious who's doing that, and then eventually you, you meet those people because of your act of yourself. So, yeah, met them, and we started, um, I don't know, talking, hanging out, making work, and then we started making work specifically together, and then um, started, yeah, like formalized that idea of working together, of collaborating, and started the Cut Collective, and that was in 2003. Um, yeah, and then soon enough got a studio, and in getting a studio, we were suddenly full-time art making, doing commercial projects and our own practice, and yeah, and then just did that for a bunch of years. So that's that's the, the way. Yeah, that was my entry into sort of doing doing what I do. Um, Did you ever have the temptation to to keep yourself anonymous when it came to the work you were doing in the street? Yeah, at, at first for sure, because like we were just doing it um, without permission, and then we started to go a bit a bit harder and um, a bit more extensively. At one point, I was doing entire shop fronts down K Road, like covering the entire shop front with posters. I thought that's going to annoy someone um, to some point, and um, yeah, there's no need that they know it's me. So the you know that the whole idea of that tradition of a pseudonym and not um, claiming that authorship or whatever under your real name just it's just a practical thing. So um, yeah, but eventually once we kind of once that had kind of run its course, uh, I don't know, a bunch of years later, it's like not so important. Yeah, so the, the use of a pseudonym is just not as important for practical reasons. It just becomes like a a hangover or a habitual thing or a or an ex existential problem you're trying to resolve about <laughs> who the fuck's making this artwork. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who am I? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, yeah. the interesting yeah. thing about that story that you're sharing, and um, actually, I, I remember years ago seeing, trust me, paste ups around, um, I think it was sort of Simon Street's kind of area where I was living at the time, you know, back in the 2000s. And um, the shift from there, where you kind of forced to, you know, do it without permission and do it anonymously to now in Aotearoa, New Zealand, where it's kind of booming, you know, and it's a, it's a career for people. It's like that's quite that's quite a sort of shift you've seen over that time, right? Um, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's an interesting one. I think there's quite a, a bit at play in that. Um, I, yeah, so there's been a evolution, I guess, in the idea of what street art kind of is, and there's sort of a, emerged this school of muralism that now is this place occupied by people who have come from graffiti and people who have come from street art and people who have come from tattoo and illustration and it's a big pool of people um, and the format of it is pretty crazy and you see it and so the festivals are a really good lens to look at it through I think like you look at what a typical wall that's achieved at a festival is these days and it's usually quite large has a lot of logistics a lot of materials access equipment a lot of time required and that doesn't resemble anything like what I still kind of think of as a wall, which to me is like the size of a single graffiti piece, perhaps, you know, maybe like four meters by two meters, five meters by two meters. That's a great wall, but you don't see them. That's not what people paint so much in this kind of practice of muralism. And it's a, so like it's a million miles away from like what me and a lot of other people started doing, which was like iterative singular things but just many of so if i'm doing an a1 poster it's like i need a space that's like can take an a1 poster if there's more i might tile like five down and uh, five down the wall stack it too high or just keep going i can fill up that space but in a minimum i just need the small piece so yeah it's um i don't know it's um it's changed so much and you don't really see there's been a resurgence of graffiti in Auckland which has been really cool to see but um, in terms of like public art that is not that that's not like hundred thousands of dollars commissioned sculpture and that isn't graffiti there's not really that middle ground anymore the only only thing that exists there is the murals really and the murals like I said to me are at an end of the spectrum of that kind of activity which is uh, resource intensive versus someone making a stencil and going, Shh, cool, <laughs> done. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess, you know, back in the day, it was like, what can you do in a really short amount of time before you get busted yeah. at, at, yeah, with, yeah. at night time? And, and now it's sort of like, even the idea for artists of a festival was that they find that quite a lot of pressure is like, what can you paint in three days, you know? So yeah, three days isn't a lot, um, but that's, but it is, it's like, but yeah, so it is and it isn't. Yeah, it's so um, it's a luxury, right? So the festival is a luxury environment in which to be able to make something, even if you're fighting the clock, like three days, four days, is going to be tight for what you're trying to achieve. But that's a luxury environment because it's it's dedicated, allocated time and resource to you just making the thing. Um, yeah, versus um, not having permission or a lot of time to actually do anything. And they're not, you can't compare them, like they're completely separate things, but there is, for, for me, is, and, and I know um, other friends of mine, there's, there's a, a relationship there that you can't remove because that's our experience of like doing that and then doing that. It's on a, there's, there's, it's on a linear line, like they're connected, but they're completely different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, just, I, yeah. Seems like the common threads might be um, that kind of, enjoyment of the surprise of something just appearing in a in a what was seen as a non-art space i think that's for me the one of the common threads is you know back in the day and, and even now if i see a bit of graffiti it's like oh where did that come from you know that's changed that space and i think murals do that too but uh, you know on a different scale different i approach. like that i like that yeah i like the way you've put that i think that's true too yeah absolutely it's just that one took um you know, 10 seconds, one took 10 minutes, one took an hour, and one took 10 days. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it does. But, yeah, they do. But it's transformative. I think that's the, one of the things that endure, enduring things that, that's so attractive about it is that it's transformational on space. Um, and it's also that act of claiming space. You know, permission or not permission, it is still an act of claiming space and saying, well, no one wants this little bit of wall here I'll have it and if no one wants the side of that building I'll have it you know I'll put some 
I'll put some time and effort into making something there. Um, yeah, and I think that the the response that like you just said, the response that I have to seeing that is the same. You know, be it like a tag or a massive mural, it's like ah, someone's claimed that. It's great. I like to see it. Yeah. In some ways, it's like um, I don't know. For me, like there's kind of a it's sort of an act of generosity as well. And I know not everyone sees tagging particularly in that way, but it's kind of like uh, taking a piece of space that is unloved and doing something with it in a kind of way of like, you know, uh, I don't know. I see it as a generous thing of like a kind of an act of love of like, this is for the city. This is for you guys. Here you go. Yeah. 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 I do too. I don't really discriminate um, too, too much along those lines. I know that, at, at a certain point, you have to. Um, but personally, like, yeah, I, I can appreciate it all. Um, and I just, you know, and, and like one thing that I'll always appreciate is initiative. Like someone just making the effort to do something. Like, because you can easily not do anything. That's super easy. So for people to be out there doing anything, and like, well, fuck, that's better than everyone doing nothing. You know, yeah. So how did that lead into how does Graffiato um, fit into all this? Because as far as I understand, Graffiato started straight out fest like that was the first straight out festival in New Zealand, right? Yeah, in that way, like there'd been a lot of graffiti events, competitions, and like um, you know, the hip hop summit, disrupt the system, all all of those things. But this was kind of like uh, different to that. And the idea of um, bringing people from around uh, country, I suppose, from different places to stay, uh, be put up and stay for a duration to make murals, paint walls. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was sort of, but, it, you know, you could see it happening elsewhere around the world. And um, it wasn't my idea. It was um, Kylie Hawker Green, who was working uh, for Erupt Festival which was a uh, incorporated society owned the Erupt Festival, which is at the biennial arts festival in Topol. And they, it was like, you know, what an arts festival is, like really diverse, lots of performing art, visual art, like all d different kinds. Uh, and um, it was every two years they wanted a satellite thing. Every other year, what can we do? And um, it was Kylie's idea to, to like, oh, why can't we do a street art festival? We've got lots of, because she'd been in Melbourne and seen the laneways. Like, we have laneways. Um, why not that? And so, yeah, she, she's, she kicked it off and um, advertised the role that I in, ended up getting, curator of the, of the event, and um, I saw it applied. So that was in the midst of, yeah, when we were sort of most busy with Cut Collective, 2011 was the first year of Graffiato. And I had kind of an internal role within the collective of production, in a way, um, coordination. So when we were doing our own large-scale projects, so basically the way Cut Collective worked, we did a lot of commercial work to make our living and then to, and to fund our art practice. So we'd take money off every job, put it in our pool, our fund, and then when we had a chance to do a, a call public art project we'd just be able to self-fund it so we'd never had to sort of, sort of look for funding we'd just fund it ourselves and um in doing those projects uh i sort of started to just become the one doing yeah coordination and production um so it was kind of familiar and so then i saw like graffiato i was like oh, i'm kind of already doing that within within the cut collective i can I know what I know what that looks like to like bring artists together and to resource them and to you know what's required to, to, to get that done. So um, yeah, so that's I, I got that job, went down and met Kylie, and we um, co-designed the first Graffiato, which was pretty hilarious in ways when I think about how we did it. What what what? How was that different from how it? Because I'm f more familiar with the kind of rec more recent Graffiatos. What what was happening back in the beginning? The main point of difference in like uh, fond memories for those who were there is um, the distribution of materials. 
like there was I can't believe we did it this way. It's like okay, so I looked at what walls we had on the books. Ten no, there was a lot of artists that year. Might have had like nearly twenty artists, I think. There was a thing, it started really big too, then we realized this is a lot to manage. So we kinda <laughs> I, I, I feel you on that, yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh so, so I sort of surveyed all the walls and I'm like, okay, yep, if I painted that wall I'd need this much paint, and if I painted that wall I'd need this much paint. So I just created a number of paint can like cans of paint. Liters of paint and cans of spray paint that would be required. Ordered it all. Um based on like a, you know, a broad color pick. All right, awesome. Yeah, so no one got to like choose their colors beforehand. No one pre, like if you pre-designed your wall and you turn up and go, well, that color scheme isn't available, too bad. Um, and it just put all the materials in the middle and then was like, okay, get it. First thing, first thing. <laughs> the first morning of the, of the event it was like it, grabbing, it's just people grabbing, grabbing, grabbing and I think um, I think Sinza and Cracked Ink were a little bit late getting there by like five minutes or ten minutes, and like got there and was like, "Oh, what's happened to all the paint?" I was like, "Oh shit!" I didn't even realize you guys weren't here, so I had to like go and take paint off all the other artists <laughs> to get paint back, so Sinza and Cracked Ink could have some. Um, I did that for like three years. It took me three years to figure out there must be a better way. I think. <laughs> Fantastic. I think the second year. I think the second year. I mean, it's. I think the second year might have like given people turns. I don't know. And then they got to barter. Like, there's a round of bartering to see what you had. And they're like, oh, I want that color. I'll swap you that. I'll swap you two of these for one of those. <laughs> yeah. That's brilliant. So, we yeah, we figured out that, uh, yeah, maybe it's a good idea to let them pre order. Uh, yeah. And just it's there when they turn up. Yeah, we we de de definitely do like a pre-order scenario for yeah you know, for, for how, how we order our paint. But you do end up with sometimes the the sponsor like Resine like covers all our paint, and they'll come back and be like, "There's no way you need that much paint for that size of a wall." <laughs> you know? I'm pretty good at that now. Like I always go through everyone's order and be like, "You don't need that much. You don't yeah. need that much. <laughs> you don't need that much." Nice try. Um, or you're gonna need more. On the very rare occasion, eh? You're like, oh, you're going to need a bit more, I think. Yeah. But most, most times people overshoot. And I understand. I do the same if given the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you don't, you don't want to be that vulnerable where you've got, you know, this huge wall to paint and you run out of paint on day three or four. Well, you know, that's a the other thing with Graffiato being in, in Topo is there's no supply. Like, there's, a, there's acrylic, uh, you know, it's Bunnings, Resine, might have 10, but there's no spray paint. So if you get that wrong, yeah, that's it. Yeah. I, I definitely ordered generously when I came down for that reason. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah, not running yeah, yeah. out of paint. I'm not driving well, back. Are you to... gonna... <laughs> no, you're going to drive to Hamilton and, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> no. Actually, when I went to um, Power Hour in 2015, super interested in, like, how do they do it? That's the reason I went. I didn't go as an artist. I went as production, um, production research trip, actually, and um, working with the production team. I was like, how do they do that paint? And because they got a lot of artists there and they just basically do a draw, your number out the hat and then they open the paint room and number one goes in first and they get to pick whatever, three or three boxes of paint, whatever, through to about 50, there's like 50 artists or something, maybe not that many, but tons of artists, they will go through and then they go back through again but in reverse order. So number 50 is last into the room, picks their paint, but then they get to stay in there and put pick the next round and then number 49 will go in. So number one, who went in very first, then goes in last. And that, that was how they did theirs. I was like, oh, that's interesting. That's, uh, but it's a long, it's like a day's worth of activity. <laughs> and challenging for people whose work is defined by a particular color palette, eh? Hey? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they've probably changed their approach too. Yeah, pre-order. <laughs> yeah, I can see how if, if someone was competitive though, they'd be like, I'm taking all the paints because that's really going to mess with Paul. <laughs> yeah, He's going to want right. these paints. <laughs> <laughs> Trading. Yeah, yeah. We, we're thinking of doing something similar now. Um, and it, I think we're still that idea. I like that number system. That could be fun because we've got kind of slowly stacked up too much of leftover paint. Plus the museum recently gave us like all of their leftover paint. 
from like the you know, the kids installation works that they do mm. there. So there's heaps of bright colors in, a, in our car park um, just down here where um, just kind of doing it as a free for all. So no, nobody gets to order the pint, but you've got access to whatever we've got left over from the no. last few festivals and go for it. But yeah, put it all in the middle. Yeah, I, li I like this um, yeah. this raffle and barter system. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, right. Social experiments with artists. Yeah. How will they behave? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it'd be cool to talk about. I'm really keen to talk about your art as well, Ross. Um, so you, I mean, I you know I've, I've seen your. We, we talked about your early work, like paste ups, and obviously um, a lot of text based work. And then that's, um, we can see that piece behind you is quite indicative of what I am familiar with with recent work, which is, is kind of the text stuff has become even, has become abstraction, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, um, you're right, like that's probably the, th the thread through all my work going right back would be text typography. Um, and not not typography, text, because typography uh, infers a certain nerddom, and and I I'm a fan, but I don't get that. I don't go in like that, um, uh, you know. So that I can't claim that I'm into typography because I sort of I know what that means <laughs> in terms of how serious that makes you about it. I like letters, I like fonts, um, but I like text. Yeah, and so um, like I've always been a bit like um, I've always held. The idea of making, uh, expressing through music and expressing through art next to each other and going, fuck, we're disadvantaged quite heavily in, in a lot of ways. We have some advantages in others, but it's always like when you hold them side by side, you're like, damn. So like in terms of um, communication, um, evoking response and people creating dialogue, um, both can do it. But I feel like music kind of has a, a bunch of advantages. So it's like I couldn't get up away from inc including text because if I want to communicate well fuck, I might as well communicate um and that's been that's been present for so so much and then yeah and then I just sort of uh, I had to write about it for a statement about it at some point I was like ah oh, I just I don't think any more needs to be said by anyone like everyone's this is is just just surrounded by opinion and um, statement and dialogue and everyone's got something to say because it's that it, it, our environment, our media environment just saturates us with message and people saying something. I was like, I actually don't think I need to contribute to that <laughs> anymore and, and probably it'd be better for me to like not, yeah, I've said enough for now and I don't think anyone needs to hear anything more. And um so I just retreated really away from it into um, abstracted form of it. So all of the all of the the shape and form is is all uh, it all comes from letter letter form still. Um, it just is illegible. It's just been abstracted so much that it's yeah it's simply about shape. But it means that I can also like for me within the work I can communicate. I can tell my stories using te t text uh it's just that no one else can see them yeah 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 and yeah that's right it's still um it's communication but it's a, it's it has a different way that it's received and i really like what you're saying there about not necessarily wanting to add to the noise because i mean i'm feeling that right and <laughs> but in 2021 there's a lot of noise and, and most of it is in in written form you know yeah yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, it, it, yeah, it's exactly that. Not not feeling like there's a need to contribute to the any more noise, and but I still need to be making stuff for me for my you know fulfillment. Um, yeah, some of yeah, those ideas but, uh, remind me of um, um, Margaret Kilgallen. Do you do you know her her, her work? Yeah, she was. Um, I mean, still using really big text, but using lots of like figurative kind of folk art kind of stuff but I was listening to a doco about her quite recently and I hadn't realized but she worked her day job was like repairing books in a library and just when the way, way you described yourself there to like with maybe not using that term typography um I think she, she had a kind of similar idea she had this obsession with text but maybe not so much as a calligraphy artist or a typography artist or something 
But to the point even like her trees, she had these quite iconic trees she do, but the bottom of the trees would be based on serifs of certain texts. And she would, so she would really start drawing text but then let these things evolve into figurative elements. And you could just see that relationship when you describe the, abstracting the, the text forms into these abstract shapes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's, it's such a different place to be playing. I probably made abstract art before I made any other art. Like, like when I think about, you know, not as a kid, but as at school, at high school and so on. Um, that's what I was making. That's what I enjoyed. And then by virtue of studying graphic design, it all became, you know, about symbols and text and icons and, you know, and clean line and flat color and got seduced by that shit. And it's, um, I still have a strong, like, uh, uh, it appeals to me a lot. Um, so this is like, for me, this work is like going back to high school, me, high school Ross. Um, and um, it's a hard place to, to work from after such a long time away, but it's quite freeing. And all, all it really is, is that I just needed a, a line to pursue to, to, make, to, have, to get me making and for the sake of making because that's 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 all that's all that i'm trying to achieve and um it started about a year ago of a bit of a, a renewed focus because I, I wouldn't have had like an effective studio practice since 2008 2009 if i think about it seriously and that means you know having a work in progress in your studio on the regular and spending time in studio, looking at it, thinking about it, making it. So it's been a long time away from that mode. Because um, it's all been just like working outside, painting murals, painting walls, whatever. Um, making one-off works. That's, you know, group show, make two paintings. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but there's no continuity of practice. And... Um, so yeah, the like the the whole point of of a year or so ago was to like no, I need it, wanting to reestablish that, and um, just having something to explore and putting no mm, objectives around it other than for the point of making, and so that's yeah the work that I'm doing that's that's that that's what it's sort of started as and it will develop and go whatever direction it goes, but I'm just sort of enjoying. Um, being a bit more in there. I'm not there yet in terms of, you know, properly engaged with it, but um, I'm a lot closer than I was a year ago. Yeah. I'm interested in the relationship between that studio work you're making and your, um, and your outdoors work. Is it, does one lead the other or are they sort of all part of the same conversation? The part of the same conversation now, it hasn't been that way. That's the thing. I think like, I think if you actually do have, um, like, if you are properly engaged with studio practice, then the, it's very, I think it's quite hard to separate for me. But it's been, they're being very separate, you know, last 10 years or so because um, there's been no proper studio practice. So it's like, they're like one offs that just come out of wherever they come out of. Meanwhile, the walls are doing what they do. But now um, they, are, they are very in, intertwined now. And, um, it's cool. I mean, they don't have to be. You can have a, like, you can be working well in studio and well on walls, and they don't have to have much of a relationship. It's up to the artist, eh? But um, this is something that I'm quite enjoying is that, yeah, they are starting to speak to each other effectively, and the fact that um, they, they, they're feeding both ways the walls into the studio work and the studio work into the walls. And then it's just a matter of like scale, essentially. You know, problem solving the scale. Like if I make a mark in the studio that's like this, what, am I, what do I need to do to achieve that if it's like a massive wall? You know, that mark like that in the studio on a wall is not the same. <laughs> it's got to, you know, you've got to scale it up or you've got to find a way to reproduce what it's doing in your studio. To, what it needs to do on a wall. You've got to figure that out. So that's quite an enjoyable process too.
Well, that's right. That's kind of um, for artists, problems are, tend to be more exciting than for other people, right? So you get a problem like that and you're like, oh, okay. You know, what am I going to do? And it's sort of actually like, that's the creative process is like mm -hmm. trying to solve these ridiculous kind of scenarios that we set up for ourselves, these challenges. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah, it's endless. It's endless. Yeah, artists are lucky in that their life's work will never end. You know, it's like there's too many problems in front of you. Uh, you will never, uh, you will never solve them all. Yeah, his name's just escaped me, but it was an artist who achieves like, um, like ink, like washy ink bleed on paper. You know, like on watercolor paper, like pretty iconic kind of mark. But to try and like emulate that on a wall using spray cans, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's that. Uh, it's pretty pretty amazing. Like, I got some ideas about how you'd do that. Yeah, <laughs> I'd love to hear them. <laughs> don't, don't know if it worked. Yeah, but you know, but that's the thing. Like that as a as a problem. Put put a problem like that to me, and I'm like, oh yeah, that sounds fun. Like figure that one out. Like yeah. Mm. Are your are your marks actually parts of letters, or are you more just sort of thinking in lettery ways? Like, do you is it like you lay out some letters and then you'll just zoom into one little bit of it? Oh yeah. So if you can imagine, because I still I use um, Photoshop a lot and I compose. I'm trying to fight that, like composing paintings in a digital space before making a painting. So it's a it's a version of drawing, right? So you can like sketch out a composition on paper if you're working on a painting idea. Um, yep, that's cool. You can have a rough idea and then see how that translates as you go through the process of making the painting, or you can. Um, you can make a plan. So that, wrong side. That, that. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. one of the. So that's that's a plan. So that's like in in Photoshop with assets, whatever visual assets, doing composition until it, you find it right, until it works, until you've got yeah, that's that's it. Um, and then just doing a straight replica of that. So that's cool. I'm happy with that mechanical process. I'm interested in challenging myself with removing that and having to do make more intuitive decision making in the making of the painting itself but um yeah so in in those in those like you might have a a, a canvas in photoshop like this big then i might have a letter that big that goes off the canvas and then it just clips clips the canvas then another letter sitting over here that big or another one like that big and so yeah, if you can see off the canvas, there's there's a shitload of letter form off the canvas. So the canvas just becomes really a crop, like I think you said just before. It just sounds like big brush strokes to me when I think about painting or, or the other stuff you're doing. It's like just using the letter form as kind of its own brush stroke. Mm. Or mm. a gesture, yeah. I guess. And, yeah, and then, then you're just reduced to those simple things of like you know, composition, balance, tone. Um, Texture, like uh, contrast, uh, you know, like those those fundamental elements, uh, visual elements of trying to figure out how they become successful. And if you can, if you if you can um, get to the point where they're successful, you you look at the thing you've made and you go like, yeah, that I like that. Um, and then you can try and go one step f further and try and figure out why. But that that's quite that's quite hard sometimes. And do you, do you feel the need to to um, to change your your kind of medium between the walls and the canvas? You know, so I wanted to. I wanted to. I didn't want to be spray painting in studio. Um, but I'm finding it really hard. I'm finding it really hard to not. Like yes, so airbrush, yes, I have, and have used, and um, it's not the same. It's it's not convenient like grabbing a can is but you know even with a you know so if you're using a certain brand of paint there's 200 colors it's great but there's still gaps in that in that spectrum of color so yes if you're if you're mixing your own color like you've got you know infinity so that's an its advantage but then you know it's just like uh, you've got to mix and clean and maintain versus a can i've been too too accustomed, I think, to the convenience. 
So I just end up reaching for a key. Using a key. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm always trying to challenge that. And brushes, I like, yeah, brushes. This, uh, I, they have their place. It's just like, not for me, not not for me typically. Oh really? So I'm just it's looking at that. It's a that other painting on your wall. Is that place. not brush marks? And so that is? one, uh, eh, not ish. No. It's cardboard, I think. I think I've oh, really? painted around with cardboard. Oh cool. Yeah. So like all of like this is the thing. Like my my fundamental uh, introduction to art at high school. I had a fantastic art teacher, a really good art department. Um. Well, he was the art department, really. But it, we never sat down and did any... That's not true. But from fifth form on, we didn't do observational drawing. We didn't do realistic rendering. We didn't do oil painting, acrylic painting or anything. We were like, we were mixed media, given like, here's some Indian ink and some shellac. Here's, here's a bucket of white paint. Um, here's some sticks and some cardboard and... And it was just like an uh, approach that sort of he had, my teacher had, and it was just very tactile, very expressive, quite rough. And, um, so, yeah, never never went down that road. So pushing paint around with cardboard, I'm like, yeah, oh, this, this is familiar, this is fun. Um, brush in hand is like, oh, what do I do with this thing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I wanna, uh, it's challenging. It's challenging. Like I, because of my background in graphic design, I want to make sharp, clean lines. <laughs> That's what I want to do with the brush, you know. Um, yeah. So, but I've 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 been on a few projects over the last year where um, it's more of a, it's it's had a role, and um, I was like using one today, helping helping my girlfriend, and it was like it's a different space mentally. It's a it's actually a bit of a nicer space because it's just like this meditative. It's much more meditative. Versus, I find spray paint is like more of an like an industrial. I feel more like a tradie when, when I'm on spray paint. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like just like ah, like big movements, like a lot of energy and duh, yeah. And the brush is just like oh yeah, it's like calm, like peaceful, yeah. Um, which appeals to me, but I I just I just don't really know you know what to do with it other than to paint that color. Yeah. I mean, I think we all sort of develop our, our, our own languages, right? I mean, you know, conceptually, but also with the actual materials. And that becomes really comfortable. It's like, it's like trying to speak with a new language when you pick up a new bit of material. It's like, what well, you kind of like, to me, that does feel like, you know, trying to learn a new language. It's all, you can kind of do it, but it's all like, uh, like it's, and then you get it a bit wrong and it's sort of, you know what you want to achieve, but you can't quite do it. You know, that's how it feels to me anyway. Yeah, I think I think when you use traditional stuff, like when you say paintbrushes, I get that. It's like, because it's like got, you know, all this, the weight of art history on it too. You know, it's like, it's like, it's, it's this kind of, it's <laughs> this proper <laughs> real thing that you use yeah. to make painting. But, um, but it's like taking a broom to a wall and then um, throwing it into some paint and, or cardboard. Like, I, like that makes more sense as something that's just free. And it's like, because it's, it doesn't matter if I don't get it because it's like not the proper tool anyway. It's yeah. like, it's, it's just going to happen what's going to happen. But then other people will, yeah. I was going to say, other, other people will then put their take on what those materials mean as well. So people will be like, you know, there's this sort of, for a lot of people, you use spray paint, it's like, oh, that's cool. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, cool guy. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Like it's kind of a bit, bit more badass than a yeah. brush. <laughs> <laughs> if the only new is better. I did a I did a project last year. I painted a mural for um, Shane Cotton, not for myself. So his his art, totally different field of art. Yeah, I saw that um, online. It was massive. Yeah, spent a month painting this thing with brush, and it was pretty cool. And Tell you what was different about though, like there's freedom in not doing your own art. It's like someone else's art. It's like, oh, okay. I'm not, it's a, it's a different space you inhabit. And it was a brush, and I've just said how I've 
challenging I find a brush, but if you know Shane Cotton's painting, it's like, you know? And so the challenge for me was like, not to make it clean and tidy. And once I could, because that's my inclination, I want to make everything clean and tidy with nice tidy lines and yeah. So once, once I could put that aside, I was like, oh fuck, this is actually just like liberating. So that, that was, um, yeah, a month, a month spent, um, enjoying what a brush has to offer. Um, and as enjoyable as it was, I still don't know where that could find a home in my work. You know, I'm still stuck with fucking spray paint. <laughs> yeah. <For> now. <laughs> yeah. You say that, but I, I get really attracted to some people that will paint like a, like photorealism, for example, you know, this incredibly intricate process of painting. And then but it's the idea of spoiling it where they just take a brush loaded with a bright color and just smash it into the middle of the face and, you know, drag it off aggressively, you know, and it's, it just leaves that this energy that's kind of, kind yeah. of incredible. But at the same time, it's like, what have you done? And I just like, <laughs> how, how do you do that to yourself? <laughs> it's bold. <laughs> you know? it's brave move. It's bold. Yeah, for sure. See, I'd like to be able to paint uh, realistically, figuratively with a brush so I could do that. Yeah. That appeals. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, I mean, the other, the other interesting thing about your work is that you, you've often gone into collaborations as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do you, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that and, what, and kind of what that, bring, like, what that offers you as an artist and what that does to your work? It's just, um, I've, I figure it's just, it's beyond um, being an artist, it's just how I like to, to do things. Like, when I do other work that's not art making, but you know, programming or coordination or curation or project management, whatever, like my inclination, if it's big enough, is to job share. It's like, ah, I, I want to do this with someone else, you know? And so there's, there's someone I do that with on those kind of jobs and have done for a, a few years on some of them. And it's like, yeah, so it's not about art making it's just about working and so um but the first place i encountered that inclination was in art making and um the cut collective is probably like the, the high tide mark for me with that because we just went so hard down that road like um yes you're working in a collective and a crew of artists and you we you know we shared the same space same studio so you have your individual thing you pursue your own works you make uh, but anything like all the work all the commercial work all the uh, outdoor work all the murals was collaborative and then we did quite large art projects as like exhibition projects um, as as a as a collaborative art identity um, and those ones so you know we did a show at uh, Auckland Art Gallery New Dallas we did Dunedin Public Art Gallery these these shows allow you to really 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 focus in on you know you're going to create specific artworks for a space you've got to inhabit mentally the same place and you've got to co-design and co-author and co-execute all the stuff all the different parts of these exhibitions and um, we got really, really good at that. We got, um, and it, it needed, what it needs you to do is to kind of like be able to put your own agenda aside and accept for the good of the um, collaboration that you have to do what needs doing. And uh, if you do that for over a long period of time, you kind of occupy roles in that, you know, it's like, oh, they're quite good with this kind of thing. So you end up in, in these somewhat defined roles, but you've got to be okay at accepting that. And um, you can do it to a point and then you can't. And that's like, so it's, it's again, that analogy of visual art and music. I don't know how you sustain a band beyond, you know, 10 years. Most don't, I guess, um, because it's that um, fulfillment 
putting aside the fulfillment of your personal needs. And when you can, you'll achieve more as a group than you can as individuals. We saw the evidence of that. It was so clear. But it's hard to do, and it's hard to continue to do that. Yeah, negotiation and um, proactive ear clearing, like clear the ear proactively. Like we were hard, about, quite hard about that on ourselves, and uh, regular, very regular with it, rigorous about it. Because if you don't do that, then yeah, your days are numbered. So we we were quite good at that, but it, it did run its course. But like, so for me, that that sort of was really illustrated what you can achieve when you're able to work in synergy with someone else. You can, you can achieve a lot more. And I just like, um, and so I, yeah, I continue to do that. So like I work with flocks on an ongoing basis now uh, as well. So, you know, we have our collaborative, our larger collaborative murals that we do, developing a sort of our own kind of visual language within that collaboration. You know, we work obviously in cut collective. So like that's, the other benefit of, of, a, of a collaboration is yeah, when it works is like it's seamless. It's, it's yeah, it's like you, you, it's so easy. It's so easy in the making of the, and like when you get to the wall, you know exactly the way that each of you is going to go about it. Um, and I've got, yeah, and I've started, um, you know, another collaboration um, with my girlfriend as well on, which is a newer one. Um, We've been working. We probably painted our first painting together maybe earlier at the start, very start of this year, and it's and it's um, yeah, it's it's completely different space mentally to, to the one that I have with Flox or one that I had with Cut Collective or other artists that I have have and continue, you know do work with. Um, and they're all different and they're all challenging, and maybe that's what I like about it is like. You know, at the very start, it's like, just give me a problem. Give me something to solve. You know, it's the same. So collaboration presents all sorts of challenges that need solving. Yeah. And so new it's ones. Just, it's that just you more don't of that. On your own. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and you know, um, you get outcomes that you would never be able to uh, achieve on your own, especially when you sort of reach to a space which is, so the ones that I'm um, doing with my girlfriend are quite different with Margarita. They're quite different. Our, our, our approach is really different. Our medium's different. Um, yeah, so there's, a, there's quite a bit of space to bridge there. There's quite a few things to figure out. Um, there's more challenges in that one. Yeah, so th and that's quite attractive, yeah. I think, you know, one of the things I find really interesting about collabs is it's... Uh, at, at uh, it kind of requires of you to be bold and confident enough to step up when you need to and claim space, but also humble enough to just step right back, you know? And that's those are two quite sort of interesting skills for artists to keep negotiating oh, together. Totally. That you nailed it really. And also um you're allowed to get that wrong as well, but you need to be able to realize when you've got it wrong. And you go, oh, yeah, this is where I step forward and do this. And then you do it and you're like, oh, nah, shit. No, 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 sorry, sorry. Backing out, backing out. <laughs> that was, like, that wasn't, the, the, no. you know, like, because, yeah, you can't be sure all the time. It's instinctual and you, you, can, you develop, you've got to develop a language of communication around that as well. Um, but it does, you can't be cowed by, or maybe, yeah. So you've got to be prepared to get it wrong, but also have the ability to, um, yeah, step it back and and just communicate in it. But it is it's hard. No, I don't think um, it doesn't satisfy or suit everyone, and that's fine. But for me, yeah, it appeals quite a lot. Yeah. And does that? Do you find that that uh, influences your individual practice as well, or is it sort of? Oh yeah, because I'm always think I'm always thinking of like how <laughs> I, I am. Like I, I, I've uh, able to project like potential uh, things to explore with tons of artists that will never happen, and that they don't, won't even know that I'm even That's considering. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> imaginary collabs. That is so good. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Imaginary collabs. But I also do that. I also do imaginary work without a collab, like their work. I think about lots of other artists' work. Going, man, if they did this and 
I can see where this they could do this and do this and this. So that's that thing of like uh, when you've done a bit of curation and and programming type of work, and you're like, ah, oh, there's so much potential with this. It could really work in this kind of space or with this opportunity. Uh, you start to do that. So I do that all the time. I look at uh, lots of artists and go, oh, ooh, they could, you know, that'd be really great if they did this. Or I love that definition of curation. I think that's that's what attracts me to it as well. Is that it's you're kind of imagining for the artist. You know, it's like you're stepping into their shoes, shoes a little bit to see what it would. Um, you know how how their work will work with somebody else in the gallery, or how it will work with you know beside someone else on that wall. And um, it's a, it feels like quite a privileged place to be to kind of choose the artist in that way. But it's it's a really awesome creative process in itself. Yeah, I re I enjoy that a lot. Actually, I I agree entirely. I always have enjoyed that part of the role of doing Graffiato and all fresco is like, um, yeah, com the combination of artists together and the relationship between the spaces of where they're painting. Um, I've never, I've once done a forced collaboration. Uh, that's a really appealing idea to me is to force artists to collaborate. Oh. Um, and you know, whether they enjoy it or not, don't care. It's the process of, you know, it's the process of and the potential outcome. But I've never, I've only ever done it once. I sort of, I put Sinza and Beast Man together once at a Graffiato because they both had real young kids at the time and it just, you know, it just sort of like they were able to kind of switch in and out. It wasn't even that big a wall, but um, yeah. And um, yeah, yeah, it was, it was a good outcome. Um, and it meant they, they had to spend time together. So you, you know, you also makes people form relationships as well. Yeah, I remember that one. I think it's gone now. Is that one of the ones that... Yeah, they knocked it down. Yeah, 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 yeah. knocked it down. I just in found the out recently. That was yeah. a cool wall. That was yeah. a cool wall. It worked for sure. I feel like there's a reality TV show in there, like forced forced collaborations. Same. <laughs> get, get a few volatile personalities in there. Have they done the yeah. mural version of like one of those reality shows yet? Is it a mural yeah. version? I don't know. There is a graffiti version that I saw years ago. It was weird. Yeah, super weird. Like Ink Masters, but kind of graffiti painters. Yeah. Yeah, segue, but you just made you just reminded me of secret walls. Have you ever done any of the secret wall stuff or follow them? No, no, no. I haven't. Yeah, we got we we never pulled it off. I think it was a something we we're planning before COVID, and mm. you know, it's one of those things that just fell off the table again. But um, yeah, I love that idea of like it's kind of similar. It's like there's a forced kind of collaboration where an artist works on top of another one, or um, I think their finale is where there's two canvases up. And you've just got black pens each, and it's like a battle, like with drawing, and then the crowd. Oh, I know what you're talking. I know what you're talking about now. Yes, actually, I think, yeah, yes, I've been involved in one of them in some capacity, not as an artist before. This is a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I like I like the idea of um, the fun and games that you can and position and positions you can put artists in where they're uncomfortable. <laughs> and having to like work outside their comfort zones, uh, you made that us really that. appeals to me. You made us do that before Graffiato. Yeah, well, Graffiato had we did about four of them as like, and I, I always knew that was kind of perverse because quite quite unfair on the artist, but like real fun for everyone else to kind of watch, especially for me, knowing that you know most of the artists probably aren't even enjoying it. <laughs> but like, let's see what happens. Like it's, you know, I don't know. I think there's, you know, it's that working outside your comfort zone always kind of gives you something. And is this something that you tell them when they arrive? So you no, don't have to they're, agree they're to it warning, before? I think a little, bit, a little bit of warning. <laughs> they don't really know what was in. It's been canned. Like us, we've removed, it got removed from the program now. So it was called Artists in Action. And it was like the first uh, activity that the artists would do. And it was like an icebreaker really. Except if you can imagine doing an icebreaker in public on a stage or something, you know, it's like, so it's not really breaking ice. It's, um, yeah, but it's done in a social setting, but it's like definitely a performative aspect to it on the artists. And it's so unfair because like, you know, that mis the common public misconception that you're an artist, you can draw anything. Like you could, you know, oh, you could draw a, a kangaroo. You could draw yeah, a yeah, that's right. design, design my tattoo. You can say, no, 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 no. 
So you're putting like everyone in this position where um, people with illustration background are probably going to flourish the best. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's it's the form. It's like a short blast format, and like people who are like, oh, I don't draw ever. Like me, I don't draw like that. Um, terrible place to be put in, unless you you know, unless you rip rip the whole bloody end of the pen out. And then shake the pen over the canvas, and then get your cardboard, eh? Get, <laughs> I don't know, you know, that? like, but, <laughs> yeah. Why didn't I think of that? But, <laughs> yeah, these the, those those things. I don't know. There, there's always been a bit of an appeal to me with these construct environments in which you kind of make artists work outside their comfort zone. Yeah, let's back back to this problem solving again. I mean, it feels like it's in the same vein of um, just creating up parameters or limitations for creativity to thrive yeah I, the other part where it, it's unfair as well though with it all is uh, i don't um care about um public performance or that kind of thing or like being in front of people and i you know that's it's that's unfair to assume that all artists like that because a lot aren't that's why I, you know a lot like to be shut the door to their studio and just be left alone or go paint a wall and have no one talk to them like that's that's legitimate, that's fine. And suddenly, you know, these situations where <laughs> they're in a very public place with people standing behind, like right behind them, looking at them while they're trying to, you know, do art. Um, real unfair. <laughs> <laughs> he says as he's laughing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, like I said, there's something perverse about it. And um, yeah, I get a giggle. I am sympathetic to people and to the diverse, you know, needs of our artist community. But yeah, I do get a giggle. We did we did a live painting thing in Toronga a while ago, and it was um, yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty chill. There was some like music going on, and some people were doing projections instead of painting live. And yeah, some of us are just painting on canvas on the wall. But this, <laughs> the person documenting it came up, and I was you know getting pretty close to to the to the canvas with my little brush. And then I just saw her phone just come into my peripheral <laughs> vision. And then she just put it like right in front of my face. <laughs> like, How do you not know this isn't okay? <laughs> but it was, it was, I loved it. You know, it was really funny. Uh, but just yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> like that doesn't happen in the studio. You know? yeah. yeah. Oh, I think, I think we're out of time, but it's, it's been so good talking to you, Ross. It's been super interesting. Uh, and um, yeah, man. Yeah. I love it. I love this kind of chat for sure. Cool, man. Thanks very much. Like I said, I could keep going. But um, yeah. Oh, well, we'll I'm see you cool. in March anyway and have, have more yarns then. But thanks so much for joining us. It's been mm -hmm. really good. Thanks, guys. Cheers, Ross. If you're still listening, well done. Uh, coming up, we've got Boone on Campus uh, in March at the Waikato University. Uh, where we're bringing artists, including Ross and, and Margarita, to, to paint some walls. Um, so keep your eye out for that. If you want to follow us, find us on Instagram at Boone Street Art um, or our website, www.boonstreetart.co.nz. Do easy. <laughs>